I'm going to welcome you all to episode two of the Blom webinar series. Um, the Blom webinar series is about sharing the magic of architecture. Um, it's a pretty amazing profession and it can be really incredible. Um, and the series on badass houses is really to remind us of what is possible when you're designing a really big house or fancy house for someone on an amazing site. And the reason um, I have put this together is because I'm busy with a, in the office, we are busy with a really big house and we wanted to inform ourselves about what the strategies can be to get the best out of a particular site and program. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Torsten Deckler. I'm an architect based in Johannesburg. I run a company called 2610 South Architect. It was founded together with Anna Grafner about 15 years ago. And since the beginning of last year, I'm heading that practice up. Episode one um, was an introduction to the badass houses. And um, that really looked at John Lautner, who, in my opinion, was really an incredible architect and who managed to really elevate the human experience in the houses that he designed. And what he did is he eliminated all sorts of references to suburban uh, living and managed to integrate the houses uh, with the landscape. As you can see in this clip, which is from a James Bond movie, and it's the Elrod house, and there really is no, here we go. There's like no inside and outside, it's all nerds. And quite a few of these houses have made it into Hollywood, um, Hollywood films. And that probably has something to do with how cinematic and dramatic they are. Um, I, I really got tired of John Lautner in that one week that I put this all, the first episode together. Um, and because it looked so, like he always spoke about a total idea and the houses are so powerful. And I thought, let me look at other examples and also some of our own work to illustrate how um, we can think about achieving some of the things that John Lautner has achieved, but possibly on a budget or with less spectacular sites. I have to say, though, that I watched the talk that John Lautner gave at Sci Arc, a recording, and he came across as a super nice guy, super chilled. And I think that really in also was very encouraging in the way that. Um, you know, that's probably a character trait he had in order to pull off what he did. And Jeff Goldstein, one of his clients, was saying that in the 15 years that he worked with Lautner, Lautner never ever spoke about his vision, always asked Jeff what his vision was. So I thought that was really cool. So episode two, there's another um, five episodes that we're going to go through. It's going to go from the general to the specific. Um, we're going to go into how do houses connect to sites? And how can you exploit what a site gives you? Often people will buy a property because it has an amazing view um, or some interesting features. And we're going to look at how um, we can exploit those. But also, what if you have no features? And what can you do then? Um, and what if you encounter really big problems along the way? So I'll share some of the um, kind of adventures we've had. So we're going to dive right in here. So topography is a really obvious one. It's one of the first things we ask for is a contour survey. Even if the site looks flat, it always has some uh, slope to it. But on quite dramatic sites, um, that is incredibly important to understand the site correctly. And I'm starting with Albert Fry and his second house that he built for himself. He was a Swiss uh, architect who settled in the US and in Palm Springs. And that's also the site where the Elrod house was that I just showed you. And this is a fairly humble dwelling, but it's incredibly sophisticated. You can see Albert sitting there, enjoying the view. He's like really, in his older years, like a big lizard. Um, but also a really incredible guy. I've got a book on his work, um, and it's incredibly beautiful and sensitive. But what he, what he incorporated, and he could have avoided it, could have tried blasting it, um, but he actually uh, consciously incorporated this big rock into the layout of his own house. And you can see it there sitting under the steel uh, frame that became his house. Um, this is how the house works. It's, it's really quite small, but you know, he was retired. 
And um, you can see what's so amazing. He does two things. So first of all, he, he incorporates the rock over here, um, very similar to what happened in the L Road house. He built in a lot of the furniture. We're going to speak about the interiors in episode four. Um, but what he manages to do is he creates a kind of theater of the landscape because you can see over here, there's someone sitting by the pool, there's someone sitting on the sofa, and there's someone sitting at the dining table study. So that's over here. There's the dining table, here's the lounge, and there's someone sitting at the pool. And what that does is that you, there are no barriers to appreciating this landscape and looking into it. So there you can see what that looks like. You can see the rock lurking in the background. You really have to like rocks to live in this house. Um, and what is also quite nice, if you notice this, is that the glass facades are all in shadow. And Albert Fryer speaks in his book about really studying the sun angles, which is Maybe some of the things we, we forget or take for granted or think as long as we're facing north or shading west, it's okay. But that is a real science and you can do so much by simply modifying the kind of ease of your roof in order to, to shade glazing and admit sun when it's lower in winter. And that works like a bomb in Johannesburg especially. So we have a kind of a gift there. But it's up to the designer to be astute enough to incorporate that into the strategy. And here you can see an interior. Um, and quite interesting is how the whole thing merges with the rock, not unlike John Lautner's experiments at the Elrod and even the curtains cut at an angle. That's a very sweet uh, little segment in his book where he has a lot of stills of videos he's taken over the years of living in his house and this one I'd like particularly because we're talking about connecting to sight and it can be done on a really micro level as well, like the color of your curtains and when the desert flowers are in bloom, all of that starts coming together. So I'm going to show an example of one of the houses we've been working on. This was a house done together with Carl Jacobs, um, who was the architect of record, the site architect. He took over the project to implement it. Um, and this is in a beautiful landscape in, in uh, Monaghan, north of Johannesburg. But when we got there, we really walked around and tried to really feel out the site and find what was special about it and how to capture that. And it was quite a process, but here we're standing in what we ended up calling the sweet spot of the site. It had a little ravine on the right and this flat top mountain in the distance. But it wasn't the highest point of the site, which was very, very interesting. Mountain is over here, the ravine is down here, and you would arrive in the courtyard and a utility building and a second dwelling and then the main house over here that steps down the slope into like this little patch of lawn in the south. And then I think this is kind of part of concept development, you try things out, and what really frustrated us along the way was that there was a regulation um, that specified that, you know, you could only be a certain height here, I think it was 7.5 meters, and try as we might, we just couldn't make it work, and the client wanted an additional level, so he would come back up to look over the roof and into the distance, and eventually, we kind of cracked that by that we tried it as a model it still didn't really work we can't look out um, eventually it was just like okay let's just make this roof follow the slope and pop out a piece at the back and that kind of cracked it and it, it's a very unusual idea of making a roof that just slopes all the way um, but it sort of worked out well. We had to do several models to figure this out. And in the end, um, the shape of the roofs kind of echoed the distant hills, which was sort of a reward we got that wasn't really intended. So here you can see the house in its setting. It's very simple, simply built. And Kali did a really amazing job at detailing it. And you have this incredible veranda with the study up here that peeps over the main roof. And when you come in through the door, you turn around and turn back and face the view. 
Okay, so the next one is vegetation. These things are really, really basic, but I'm trying to show examples that kind of occupy the extreme poles of what you can do. Um, this is a scan from a book on Lina Bobadi, who I think is the ultimate badass architect. Um, and then I even named our daughter Lina because we were at some stage so enthralled by her work. Um, and this is her own house, and what you see here, which almost looks like a wallpaper, but that is the moving scenery of the vegetation that grew around her house in Sao Paulo, where you can literally plant a broomstick and stuff will grow. Um, so it's a very, very clear concept. You know, you create a glass box, it was at the time in the 50s of, you know, modernism, international style, people were totally into into glass and very reduced aesthetic. Um, and what she managed to do, and the strategy here that's really great is, like everything that doesn't have to do with living and socializing and eating happens at the back here. Um, it's quite sweet, the staff quarters get their own little patio and view, which I think is great. But then there's this really big space that's interrupted by a tree growing through the house. And there you can see the tree and what it does, it creates these interesting diagonal views through what is essentially a very, very simple space. Um, you also notice how she furnished the space and we'll talk more about interiors in episode four. Um, but it's very eclectic and it's really her personality of stuff she's collected and the space is just big enough to, to cope with that. Um, and I thought I should put in a, a photograph of Lina and her husband, because she was really a fantastic, important cultural character in Brazil. And there you can see the house sitting amongst the trees, and you approach it from underneath. And if you, if you want to, you can look at the Museum of Modern Art on the internet in Sao Paulo, which has a similar approach um, to the city, but creates this amazing Belvedere within the city, which is very dense. And so now we up the ante a bit and we also lower the budget. So this is a, one of my favorite projects by the architect couple, um, Lacaton and Basal. And the client gave them a seemingly impossible brief. And that was to say, you're not allowed to cut down any trees and I want a view of the ocean. And so what they managed to do is basically grow the, or build the house around the trees. So they didn't cut like a big atrium like Lina Bobadi did, they simply devised the detail. And if you look at the construction of the house, it's so simple and the detail is fairly simple that I think the means totally justify the end here. And it's also done with an acrylic hood so the tree actually grows through a skylight so the trees are lit up. Um, but you can see the aesthetic is incredibly, incredibly industrial. You can see the detail. I actually met Christophe Houtin who detailed that in the office um, and explained the detail to me. <laughs> it's really, really simple. There's a, like you would have on your bucky, the tonneau cover at the back, there's a series of rubber elastic bands that allow that skylight hood to move around as the trees move in the wind. And another really interesting aspect of the house when you read up about it is that they experimented with how to lay out the corrugated sheeting, cladding, um, and they found that if they made the corrugations perpendicular to the ocean and where the light is reflected, you get this incredible ambience under the house. And you can see the evidence there. And that's really what the client was after. And what I really enjoy about this house is that the brief is taken incredibly seriously and like Lautner was after realizing his client's vision, I think they managed to do the same and really resolve it in a super pragmatic way. Then materials are an obvious one that can make you relate to site in a certain way. I put this in as another house by Lina Bobadi. And in Sao Paulo, you'll encounter often like plants growing out of buildings, either intentionally or if they're ruins, like stuff just starts growing. But Lina Bobadi embraces this uh, thing instead of fighting it. 
And also it's, it's kind of tropical climate, so buildings don't do well that are just painted white, like her house, you probably learned from her house. And here this whole thing is just clad in pebbles and even broken tiles and mosaics to create this incredible resilient skin, very extremely rustic. And you can see the house here in its setting. And it's not kind of, it doesn't try to hide itself or merge with it, but it kind of enters into a dialogue with this incredibly verdant um, landscape. And it's, it's super, super simple, um, but there's real effort made in certain relationships. So the deck to the pool, um, and also you can notice there's light brought in where the lean-to touches the main building. And what that does in combination with the reflections of the water and the sunlight, it kind of lights up that really special, special facade in an interesting way. So in my view, this is incredibly uh, accomplished, but at the same time, very simple. And that means somebody's worked through the complexity of problems, which is our job. Um, and I think when somebody said that designers make complicated things seem simple, and I think this is what she's achieved here. Um, you can also see the, the kind of how that cladding works with the pebbles and also the green roof, which is we'll be talking to a special guest, uh, Vanessa Davies, at in the next um, episode, which is about going green. Um, it's quite a cliche, but literally you can do the stuff to make a green building, including all the other sustainable features and technologies. And she will be, I asked her specifically to input on green roofs, which a lot of people are completely terrified of, and she says they're possibly misunderstood and she can explain to us why. Then another way to use materials, uh, this is an example of uh, Anna and my house and studio in Brixton. And we were on a tight budget and in the end what we did is we recycled a bunch of materials that initially we thought we just have to get rid of. So this also makes forays into kind of sustainable practice. So all the bricks were cleaned and the, uh, our contractor Kind of contracted the builders, wives, and girlfriends to come in and clean, and he paid them an amount per brick. And that, in the end, saved us money on dumping the bricks and buying new bricks. It's kind of a no brainer. We also uh, used existing shutters and existing windows over here and just reconfigured them, as well as things we took out of the roof. Um, and we restored an existing pressed steel ceiling. So let me show you that. But what I'm trying to get at is that these things start entering into a dialogue. And when we can quickly just talk about heritage, obviously this left-hand side is old and that's new, you can see it. But somewhere in between it starts merging. And I really enjoy that. And I think it's kind of relevant in a society like South Africa where the heritage is tainted, um, it's contested. And I really don't think a particular period needs to be celebrated above another one. Um, so here you can see the pressed steel ceiling and that used to be a little classroom built in the 1930s so we simply took it off and put it back. Here you can see the sash windows that we put in the south facade. Uh, that works incredibly well because we need soft working light and we can open the tops to ventilate warmly out. And here you can see the shutters that were next to those sash windows. And you can also see some, kind of, this wasn't even an old door but it was around and we didn't need to get a new door. We could simply reuse it. And what it does um, within a modern envelope, it adds really interest and depth and tells the story of what kind of an architect, designer, person you are. Neighbors, um, we love them or hate them, we're indifferent or we don't know them. Uh, but in Brixton, we know all our neighbors. Um, um, but one particular thing at the back of our house was this, it's one of the only sort of working class monuments, it's a national monument and it's a corrugated iron house shop. And this big double story wall that we created, uh, we thought we would clad, because it's also the rain facade, so it absorbs a lot of moisture, we clad it in corrugated iron to create a fine texture on it, but also to start speaking to 
our neighbor in some way. And quite fortuitously, and this was absolutely not intended, if you come home, you see the Brixton Tower framed between the garage and the main building. That was like a complete um, moment of grace. And we found a bath in the garage and put that on the roof. And in a way, that gives us a connection into the neighborhood. And also this veranda is something that our building had on the street side, which was removed by the previous owner. And we thought it would be important to have an aspect that looks back into the street. We also managed in very simple ways to just frame distant views because we don't have spectacular views that face the wrong side. And you encounter them incidentally, which is one way to frame views um, instead of confronting people with them permanently. It makes them quite special if you encounter them in a sort of uh, transitory movement through space. And I'm really into Victorian architecture because I think it's kind of polite. You know, it addresses the street in some way. So I've been running around Brixton painting houses. Um, and I think that fascination kind of translates back into architecture and is a way you can connect a, a, a building into its neighborhood. And we can question why that is important. Um, I think, you know, a sense of belonging and identity is what we are all after at the end of the day. So the next question is, what if you have absolutely no features? What do you do then? Um, and for that, we turn to like the ultimate badass architect, Jeffrey Bauer in Sri Lanka. And this is his city house. It has no views, it has no features. Um, it's got amazing plants. Seems like things also grow there. But this is the street from where you access the house and you actually access it through the garage where he used to park his Rolls Royce. And I think it's really interesting that that garage became kind of an entrance hall with this beautiful car in it. And we'll show that in episode four. And we'll really go into depth in ba with Bauer and um, Oliver, who works with me. Um, he actually visited this house and has some pictures he sneakily took. So he's going to take us right inside the house. But what Bauer does, um, and this is super, super fascinating, and it actually takes your breath away with the ease. So that's the garage I was talking about. He has several entrances. There's an office component. There's a house component, but essentially this dark green is a is a kind of open walkway, it's covered partially. But we're just going to look for now very quickly at this scenario, which is described in this section. And it looks like nothing on the plan. You'd never imagine what really goes on there. But if you look at it, you descend these steps. And what Bauer does, he gives you something in the foreground, something in the middle ground with light coming from above. And then this incredible kind of light in the back, which is an open courtyard where he used salvaged antique columns. Um, and that is the main veranda at the back of the house uh, with a body of water. Obviously the climate um, is benign, tropical. And this image completely blows me away what's going on here. Um, it's kind of hard for me to explain why I like it so much. Maybe we can talk a bit about that in the Q&A. Um, it does a number of things. Um, it has light and shadow, it has it transitions, it has beautiful objects, but also has something that's incredibly intimate in terms of how the roof works. Um, so you have this contrast of scales and it maybe gives you as a human an idea that you have choice of what to engage with. And a project we're working on for a friend and colleague, Enyo Matopa, who I hope has joined us. He said he would. Um, we'll see in the q and if he's there. Um, and he has purchased the site north of Johannesburg in the Bushveld, and that bush is incredibly dense. In itself, it's, it's interesting, but there's very little prospect out of it. So whatever we do in terms of architecture needs to also, can't rely on the landscape as much. And this is the main, the main building, um, which has no passages, we're pretty, pretty proud of. But we've created a kind of roof, umbrella roof, that where the ceilings follow the slope of the roof, but this central, beautiful space um, that I'll show you now. And Oliver is busy working on this. It's just a little concept model, how it works. And that is that central 
central space that we're busy working on and that has all sorts of advantages also with cooling and um, hot air rising up through the roof light. So that project is going to site this year. And what I want to touch on now is this thing of problems. I mean, I get stressed if I encounter a problem in design, but once I kind of can work through it with help and input from other professionals and, and the client even sometimes, those problems become actually the major assets of a scheme. And I just want to show you this last project, uh, which, you know, the client was actually super pissed off and wanted to sue the landowner who sold him this piece of property. But this is on the Val, on the Free State side. And the guy who sold the property previously quarried like all of it for Crusher Run. And in the end, the flood line actually happens like this. So if the Val floods, that's where you're safe. I think it's the 50 year flood line. No, it's a 100 year one, yes. So you can build in here, and this guy had a budget and he wanted to build a great house, and so we had to do this. And the way in which we've achieved this, we built this T-shaped house, and a part of it had to, in the end, hover over that flood line. And there it is. That's the piece that sticks over the flood line. And you'll notice these V-shaped columns. Those were really references. I worked on this project with Kelly Jacobs as well, an amazing architect. If you check him out, um, C76 architecture. And we just really love the drive to site and the kind of industrial nature of the Val Triangle. And so brought those references back into the house. And one of the guests uh, of the client said, they were kind of shocked. They were like, oh, this house is hard, but it's warm. And that's really a big compliment uh, for all of us. You can see things happen like very low threshold entrances that welcome you with the roof rising up to bring in light. And this became additional accommodation for the boys like a loft. And then in taking this uh, topography, we could also create a kind of really varied house with very low uh, aspect to the river, very intimate. This facade for the main bedroom kind of cuts away so you increase that sense of privacy. And that is the house in the landscape. And we can try and look at this video. That's not the office recording bird voices, by the way. In fun. So that was it, and um, we managed again on time. Uh, this time I had more slides. Uh, I hope it was it was useful, um, and I'm looking forward to the to the uh, Q and A just now. I want to thank Salia who helped me out today with uh, rendering the plans and annotations and stuff. And also, I hope Nick is here, um, who will give episode six on contracting methods for for you know, exceptional houses and also shout out to Rian, who sort of compelled me to do this webinar, webinar series. Um, yeah, which I'm starting to enjoy more than I'm stressing. So with that, I would like to uh, end this presentation and open the Q&A. So I had a special guest lined up, um, Julia Fremantle, who's a journalist in the design world, um, but Somehow an electricity pole fell over and she has no internet in Prince Albert, but she's joining us for episode four, which is about the interiors of houses. So 
if any of you have any questions and want to start a chat, let's do that. We have like 25 minutes for that. Um, and yeah, let's, let's go for it. Unfortunately, I see Penyo hasn't been able to join us. Um, it's always, I think it's always very interesting to get an outside opinion, outside from my profession. So it'd be kind of interesting if anyone's not an architect to, to say something about what do you think about all of this. I see I have a friend from Florida, Todd Yeomans. Todd, how are you doing? I have a double Todd on the screen here. Todd just said great. So he's doing great. <laughs> Todd's an architect in, in, I think it's in Florida. Okay, we've got Andrew. Hey, Andrew, you like the diagrams? Yeah, I must say drawing the diagrams really help to understand what's going on. Um, it's one way to think things through. Um, I, I always like um, what Glenn Merkert said is that design is discovery and the pencil is sort of a tool to do that. Yeah, Todd from Sarasota told me a cool story about an alligator. Um, ben loved that house in Monaghan. Do you remember the SG stand number for that house? I'd like to see it when i next. No, oh, it's two. I think it's 228. You can also take yourself off mute if you want to talk. It's not a problem. I see Michael is here. Hey, Michael. It's nice to have friends on here. And I think Keegan, who's in London now, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe I can invite Oliver to say something about what it was like to visit that house in Colombo that we're going to talk about. Um, we're going to talk about in episode four in more depth. Uh, yes. Uh, can you can you hear me, Dawson? Yes, loud and clear. As it. Yeah, um, I was actually just typing in the comments, but yeah, I'd like to say a lovely presentation. And I think um, I'm also just thinking about <clears throat> that image that you showed, um, what Bauer achieved there was like, uh, you know, there's not a lot of mullions or like frames that like breaks down the scale of the space. That space is like, in a sense, um, is treated as like one continuous space. Um, maybe you can just quickly show it again. This one. Uh, it's just coming up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the other one. And I guess also what he does, well, which the climate helped with is that there's that always that continuous, um, you know, interchange between exterior and, uh, and interior. Mm. Um, so, and a really, really well achieved in terms of the soft light. Uh, that house is so beautiful. Nothing was too harsh in a sense. Um, mm -hmm. And it was just, yeah, it was just general, generally a lovely space to be in. Um, there's a staircase in there I was telling you earlier today that is like this yes. beautiful sculptural staircase uh, that you wouldn't expect um, in a house like this because it's so, you know, it's so modestly done mm. um, and very comfortable as well. I don't know how you achieve that balance, but, but yeah. Yeah, I think um, he was also very hands on on site, I think, um, which in the yeah. sort of certain contracting climate is uh, not really possible. I've been speaking to colleagues in, in the States and they say sometimes on some projects, the architect, once you've done the drawings, you're not actually wanted on site at all, which I can kind of understand. But um, the results that Bauer achieved were really remarkable. I'm just going to go back to the chat there. Thanks, Rashida from London. You liked the presentation. 
Oh, we've got someone from Finland. Pekka, that house must make you feel very jealous. <laughs> if you're in winter. I don't know, Pekka, is he hearing us? Pekka, hello. It actually would be interesting to try some of Alva Alto's interiors too, because uh, Finland is such a harsh climate and there's a huge amount of attention spent on interiors and especially lighting. Um, like people just don't put reset spots into ceilings because it's awful. And hopefully for the episode four, we can get someone who knows a bit more about lighting also, because that's actually an incredibly important thing, especially artificial lighting. I know from uh, an amazing architect, Michael Sutton, Actually, one of my friends lives in the Michael Sutton house. There are just no lights in the ceiling, nothing. And it makes a big difference. So you have to bring your own lamps and uplighters into the house. So, yeah, so we have a um, comment here. Most of the examples deal with inside outside connections with sight and terrain, which are lovely and ideal to bring it back to the mundane South African issues, how to deal with security. Yeah, so I really like Bauer's burglar bars over his courtyard. He's obviously, I don't know what he had to deal with, but I hear, I hear that if you stay in one of his hotels, it's a problem with the local wildlife that tries to break in. Um, what's your view on what looks like exposed corrugated sheeting on the interior of the fry house? Consider it might get super hot in summer. Well, his house is practical in that sense. Um, ben, I don't know if, uh, let's just go there. We can talk to the image. I don't know if it's hot there. I mean, if his house is comfortable. I think if you look at this, you can see there's a top sheet and a bottom sheet. So that is simply used in, in place of plasterboard or whatever else, timber that you would put in for a ceiling. So there would be insulation uh, in this depth over here. So you've basically got that distance, which is fairly, it's quite a lot. You can, if these days, if you put high density foam in there, you wouldn't even use half of it. Um, so I think that would work. Um, one concern could be acoustics. I think the corrugations uh, scatter sound. Uh, and the curtains help, and obviously it's got a carpet and furnishings in there, um, but uh, acoustics is a really, really important thing. Okay, so Ben, you, see, you saw that, great. That was a cool comment though. I like these comments because they're super practical. Um, I, when I see fancy houses that have no skirtings, I always worry about the walls getting dirty. And I'm like wondering who repaints those walls on a regular basis. I know that in Greece, people will repaint the whitewash the steps in front of their houses on a daily basis. That's pretty insane. We'll go through a few images again. What have we got here? Yeah, I think um, also what we'll talk about in episode six is the six, you know, generally accepted stages of how projects are built and realized and reflect on those together with Nick, um, who's a contractor, because he's suggesting that contractors are involved even as early as stage two, which is really when diagrams like this are produced, um, because they are the people in the end who are responsible for budget and program and for making it work. And so I'm pretty keen on finding out more on that. Okay. I think if we don't have more questions, I'm gonna wrap it up. Here we go. Can we have a look at the industrial house that floats in the trees and the Brazilian influence? Okay, let's go there. I, I really can't, I can't read chats while I share screen, which is quite frustrating, but let's try. Uh, over here, I think. So that's the Brazilian house, which is fairly straightforward, I think. 
And then the industrial house, I think is actually super radical. And these architects have created tremendous work. Um, it's really worth checking out their website and other stuff they've done. But here you can see. And according to Christoph, who gave a presentation in our office once, um, this kind of industrialized building is cheaper in France than the labor intensive building. So it's the opposite to how we work, essentially. But I don't know if that's relevant to, you know, Nick would be able to input on something like that. Whoever wanted to look at this, if you come off mute, you can tell us what grabs you about this, if you find it beautiful, ugly, both. I kind of find it beautiful, ugly, and I like that a lot. There's a sort of finesse in how these industrial materials are used and what they do with the light. I'm under no illusion that the photographer waited for magic light there. Um, that's also a problem with architecture because we consume it through images and we hardly ever go there. And I think that's why it's so cool to, for Oliver to talk to us in episode four um, about that Bauer house. Yeah, Todd, that plan is like really dumb almost. It's almost dumb, the plan. But it does a similar thing to the Lina Bobadi house where it pushes all the bedrooms to the back because you generally sleep when you're in your bedroom well, most of the time. And then it just makes that lounge really big and flexible. Oh, okay, Christopher wants to know. So I showed that detail. I can go back to it quickly. Um, so I'm not quite sure how they do it in the, on the ground. There is actually a gap, right? So you have a gap around the tree trunk. But on the top, there's a mastic seal. Uh, let me just do some sketches here. So there's a mastic seal over there and a, a kind of, like a, that's like a tarpaulin that's then clamped under this big kind of gasket. And between the tarpaulin, I think, between the tarpaulin and this clamp, there's a mastic seal. And then this whole piece actually moves. And you can see these little elastic strings that probably accommodate that movement. So it might make a noise if it moves. You know, it's probably fine. It'd be really super important to know what these clients actually think of their house. Um, okay, so let's go back. So I hope that explained it a bit. Oh, here, sorry, I've drawn the wrong thing. There's the mastic seal up here. And that is that moving plexiglass perspex thing. And those are the little elastics that hold it down over there. Cool. Okay. Good. Glad I could explain that. It's so cool that I actually met this guy who detailed it. It's really incredible how life works out sometimes. He one day just stood in front of our office and asked to talk to us. <laughs> He's doing a project in Joburg. Okay. Well, so it would be nice if you can let me know what you thought of this episode and what you think would be nice to discuss in the other episodes. So as a quick recap, the next one will be about going green, so what it means to be sustainable. And we really want to take a very broad view. Um, and I hope we can invite a consultant we've been working with, um, Kenneth, uh, who's worked on an amazing TB clinic that is completely without uh, like air conditioning uh, in, the, in the Western Cape. But if you, if you could also suggest other people who might be great to invite onto this platform um, who are not architects, maybe their clients or other uh, consultants, engineers, contractors, lighting specialists, I'm really keen to connect with people who can make this stuff happen. So to drop me a, a small message before you jump off and let me know what you thought, because this might also help us to grow the 
uh, Bloom webinar sessions into something uh, that's a little bit better resourced because um, at the moment they take quite a lot of time and energy. Um, yeah, but I think it's it's nice for us to be able to connect outside of academia in a way. It's, um, not really involved at universities at the moment. Andrew, would you show this stuff to your students? Do you think they should be looking at badass houses? Absolutely, Torsten. Um, I thought there might be one or two here this evening. I did share the, the invitation on one of the current groups that is perhaps semi-defunct because we, we although the years run till now, things are very in between. So, um, mm. yeah, until we got yeah. the new class group set up and, and the new channels of links and communi of communication going, um, it's maybe a bit, a bit disrupted, but uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I'll continue to share the links and hopefully see a lot of them in. Oh, great. Um, I will, I mean, I'm recording this the session, so we post them to our YouTube channel. Um, so it'll, it'll be up next week. So Splendid. Yeah, thanks. Easy to thanks. share them. Mm. Thanks, Zach. Yeah, thanks. Pleasure. Yeah, nice to hear you. Okay, I think that's all from me, guys. Um, thank you very much for joining. It's been nice to see people from various parts of the world, from London, Finland, from Sarasota. Uh, yeah, it's really amazing what we can do. So I am going to ask Salia to sign off and we'll advertise the next episode in, you know, next week and it will happen in two weeks time. So the episodes are every two weeks. But do let us know what other content you would be interested in. Okay, thank you very much, Torsten. Oh, Pekka, there you are. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Nice to hear your voice. <laughs> yes, yes, long, long time. I think this is this is a wonderful, wonderful uh, thing you are, you are, you are, you, you are doing here. So sorry, I missed the missed the first one, and I missed oh, the okay. half of this because I was making dinner. But I promise to watch the whole show next week. Good. Okay. I'll see you then.